everybody, this is Kodak here, and one of the items I need for an upcoming video is stuck in the mail. So I figured today, how about we do a follow-up of one of my more popular videos, Dollar Store D&D. Now, this was a video I made a while ago where I experimented with how much of a Dungeons & Dragons experience I could generate using nothing but the items you can buy at a really cheap store. Now, the reason I made this video is, I hope, fairly obvious. There has been a rather disturbing trend towards the gentrification of the tabletop roleplay hobby. Gentrification, there's your word for the day. Have fun looking that up and getting depressed. But what I mean is, particularly through the efforts of Hasbro, there's like been this trend to try to say that, oh, you're not having a real Dungeons & Dragons experience unless you have the fancy minis and the fancy dice and the fancy dice towers and the, you know, transforming gaming tables with overhead projector screens and all that. I mean, and you have to use fancy dice that are shaped like what even are these? Just in general, I have been seeing some absolutely outlandish prices for some of the things that go into this game. I know I said the player's handbook was like $30 in the video, which is incorrect. It's $50. I said $30 because my uh, old second and third edition books down here actually did cost me that much. It's gone up uh, quite a bit since... Uh, since I last, uh, since I last played, but the free rolls do exist. It only has four classes, and each of those four classes only has, um, one prestige class, but, you know, they're free rules, so can't really complain there, but there has just been a trend to really try to over-monetize Dungeons & Dragons. Like, um... I know it's because, you know, Hasbro, the investors, caught wind that Wizards of the Coast is such a huge source of profits for um, Hasbro that they went and demanded that even more money be extracted out of it. The reason Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught is so expensive is because of that gentrification bonus. So that's the thing I'm trying to fight against is, you know, people trying to fight against just this over-monetization of Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop role-playing in general. I mean... Hasbro was talking about doing, like, microtransactions for Dungeons & Dragons? Dude, Dungeons & Dragons is not a video game. In fact, a lot of people play it specifically because it is not a video game. That, what you're talking about is an act without a future. And frankly, with all of this nonsense going on, I mean, I'm currently the dungeon master of a campaign I have going right now, but... Once that campaign wraps up, if my group wants to keep going, I'm probably gonna be switching over to Pathfinder or World of Darkness over all the stuff that's happened here. But... I'm, I'm pretty sure that when I made this video to show that you could have, like, a fulfilling Dungeons & Dragons experience on a budget, most people got what I was doing. Like, I, yes, I was being sincere. That is why I, like, filmed myself painting up a Dungeon Master screen and stuff like that. I wasn't doing that as a joke. I was doing it genuinely as, like, a labor of love. And yes, I do still have the screen, although it's accumulated a few dust bunnies up here. Um, although I did notice that the comment section was kind of a funny combination of people trying to show off how smart they were and others experiencing that ratatouille scene. I mean, a lot of these people who thought they were being smart were like, oh, just download a, a dice application for your phone. Oh, they sell phones in the dollar store now, do they? For a dollar? Where do they keep them? Next to the blenders? Anyway, yeah, the, the exercise was to see just how much of the experience I provided. And the rules I set for myself was... I had to provide everything, and I mean everything, except the tables, chairs, and players. Uh, I mean, you, you don't want to, like, you don't want to pay for people to, to play games with you. That would, that's an odd evening. Um, but anyway, basically everything except the tables and chairs, because tables and chairs are everywhere. You can get them at a game store, you can get them at the library, you can get them at a college dorm, you can play on a table in the park if you want. I've, I've done D&D Under the Stars, it's, it's fun. I burned my hand on a fire pit. Um... But anyway, I spent about $50 on everything I showed off there, although keep in mind, I did not just buy the props for the actual game itself. I bought everything. I also bought the paper, I bought the pens, the pencils, the markers, all sorts of stuff that you probably already have. I bought snacks, I bought the things to put those snacks in. Um, I bought these little cubbies, which, you know, these I think were actually kind of neat. I think these are actually supposed to be like silverware trays like you're supposed to connect them together and then you know put them put them in your uh like is this, it's a silverware tray designed to fit into any kind of drawer like those weird places that have like a super narrow drawers hey now it's a, a silverware rack um but these things are great though you can fit your pens in there dice minis um glass beads whatever you use in there basically everything but your character sheet can be tossed in this cubby and just you know set aside for 
the next game. Um, <clears throat> some people also shared some other hacks. Um, there is, of course, the uh, wrapping paper hack that I showed off. It is difficult to see on camera because those lines are in something called non-photo blue, which is a specific shade of blue designed to not be seen well on camera. So that was fun to film. Um, um, some people recommended that if you take it to, like, like a teaching supply store or, like, I know a few Christian bookstores will do that as well. Uh, places where teachers go to get stuff laminated, not like an office supply store or something like that. They tend to charge, they tend to ha use like laminate that's way too thick and charge up the wazoo for it. But a place that does like the thin lamination, like I said, teaching supply stores, you can take that stuff, the, the wrapping paper, and just laminate it and have a reusable mat that you can use with a dry erase marker. It used to be in like the old player's handbook in the old Dungeon Master's Guide that they would actually have like a folding poster where the back side was a blank grid. Um, <clears throat> that is no longer true anymore unfortunately i don't think there's one in there um but that used to be the trend before they insist you go like with all the vinyl mats like the one i have here i've had this for like 20 years probably i've, I've had it for a long time um <clears throat> of course i also i didn't mention it but i showed off the hack where you can do the initiative tags where you uh write the names of all the characters on the tags and you just have them set their initiative there so it's easier to keep track of um if you want to do a dice tray you could do like a cheap plastic bin with some shelf paper on the bottom not like this specific kind of shelf paper i use this for like uh, like like war gaming miniature storage but like shelf paper you can top it in there just slice up a, a proper size and drop it in there and wow there you go a noise dampening dice rolling tray of course, a lot of the other smart acts in the comments were like, oh, you don't need a map to play Dungeons & Dragons. You can play the whole thing with the theater of the mind, which is technically true. But the thing about Dungeons & Dragons is that of all of the tabletop role-playing games, it is very tactical. It is very centered on combat, on measurements, on things like that. And a lot of people like that about Dungeons & Dragons. They like the tactics. They like the tactile feel of having a, a mat that you're moving the minis along and advancing and fighting and stuff like that um, and crazy placement and stuff like that. Theater of the Mind is more the realm of things like World of Darkness, where it's there's a lot less combat going on in this game. It's a lot more about, you know, intrigue and, you know, taking actions, like, like figuring out how to hack into a, a library computer so you can figure out what the blood cartel is up to or or something like that um but also not having a map scene like a part of the purpose of the exercise was i had to have at least one map based combat that was a restriction i put on myself something i spelled out in the video itself so people saying i didn't need to do that are kind of missing the point of the exercise because i'm trying to recreate like the big bombastic tabletop experience um emphasis on tabletop without having to spend like ludicrous amounts of money buying a magical transforming gaming table um but like i said a lot of people a lot of people got it a lot of people understood what i was doing um a lot of people enjoyed the charm of the character sheets i think i got rid of those unfortunately i did keep the gm screen because i might actually use it um but Theater of the Mind, like I said, Theater of the Mind is, it's good and all, but here's the thing, is as a dungeon master, I tend to run some pretty complex encounters. I run sieges, okay? I had, um, in the campaign that I am currently dungeon mastering right now, there was an encounter where the party had to hold themselves up in a house, they had to board up the windows and doors, they had to, had to drive back tides, they had to fix the doors that got busted down as... This army of creatures tried to make their way in. There was traps and and feints, and the monsters pulled some tricks to like flank and sneak in from the side. Even in a game like World of Darkness, if I was running a session like that, you know, like a real like real like Night of the Living Dead sort of encounter, I would still set out like a floor plan for a home to make players assert where they are committed to. I don't want it to be like a vague thing where it's like oh we're in the house I'm like oh this guy oh they're attacking the kitchen i'll go to the kitchen to deal with this you stay in the living room in case something happens you know have like that ju just a floor plan a basic floor plan to organize a scene like that the theater of the mind only goes so far and frankly it's really nice to be able to have those things organized so people don't have to go crazy about it although yeah i've played tons of games i haven't really gotten to tuck into the new world of darkness it's been a while since i played it at all i should probably play it as a player first before I try to dungeon master it, although I have also played Pathfinder, but I've checked out some independent games as well, like Rook. They made uh, a game for themselves, and if you want a deep cut, 
uh, some folks in Austin made this game called Tefra. Austin, Texas made this game called Tefra, which is like a steampunk uh, eight-sided die system, I think. I believe it uses eight-sided die. But it's, uh, it's a... I've played, like, indie games. There are so many independent games out there. You don't have to stick with Dungeons & Dragons if you don't want to. Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder, which is basically Paizo's answer to Dungeons & Dragons, are by far the most tactical, but you will find all sorts of systems out there that use different kinds of dice. Some use the multi-polyhedral dice of uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Others will use only D10s like World of Darkness. There are others out there that use only D6s or only D8s or something like that. You will you will find a game for the experience. Actually, I think Tefra is D12s. I can't remember. It's been... It has been... I don't think I've actually gotten to play a game of Tefra since college. I wonder what happened to the folks who made that. Anyway, the actual scenario I came up with. Uh, I genuinely made it up as I went along. As I found stuff in the stores, I uh, made my decisions. Like... I found a little dog that was in a little, like, carrier. It's like, oh, hey, that could be, like, an animal in a cage. And, you know, I found the dinosaurs. And there's dinosaurs in the freebie rules. And I set up, like, some wagons and stuff. I bought, like, some little wood kits. And I, like, glued them together and stuff. It wasn't a terribly pretty setup. But, you know, given a little time, I probably could have come up with something more ingenious. Um, the thing is, I did my setup at Easter. And Easter does not have a lot of stuff lying around for those kinds of setups. It's better to do it in like Christmas because Christmas, they always have like the little Christmas village setups. They have like trees and little houses and churches and stuff like that. That is where you build like a little city or something like that for uh, your characters to move around in and investigate. But uh, there were some interesting things to come out of that. Uh, I have not written down the scenario, unfortunately. Maybe I should at some point, but I didn't even stat out the dinosaur there, um, but I did have an idea that I call it something called the Aspect of Extinction, like the big zombie dinosaur. Uh, I call it the Aspect of Extinction. I know it sounds terrifying, but this is like a third level campaign, so it would be like maybe a fourth level, like, elite enemy or something like that. So it's like a zombie that relentlessly tries to devour things, but, you know, it's an undead, it can't digest anymore, so it's just full of food, and I imagine it has, like, a like a uh, breath weapon style attack that's just like it's puke going everywhere it would be it would have been a pretty tricky fight um as for how i handled the scenario i do have some interesting dungeon master tricks that i employed there i did do the setup of the milk run um i brought in the background of the thief backgrounds i honestly feel are really underutilized i don't think they're terribly well designed is part of it um a lot of them just don't have a chance to do anything if you have like a city-based one. If you're not going to many cities, you're not going to be able to use that very much. Soldier gets like basically nothing. I do wish that they integrated backgrounds a bit more. I do feel like somebody with soldier should be able to roll with proficiency or even with advantage to like recognize a battlefield or a famous warship or something like that. It's probably one of the biggest weaknesses of, of fifth edition. Like fifth edition, the idea is that your character class is what they do in combat, and their background is what they do out of combat, but I don't know if that part really got properly identified and implemented. A lot of people just built the character classes from, like, earlier editions and stuff like that. Um, but the fighter was the one who had survival as a skill, so... To roll to track the carriage, I had him roll. He rolled a 9. Um, I made up these rolls myself. I kind of come up with a challenge rating in my head when I have to come up with it. He rolled a nine, but the dilemma is you never want to give your party rolls that they can fail for something necessary to advance the plot. Um, in a game I was a player in, the dungeon master uh, had us try to find a crane, which was necessary to do something, but we failed the check. So we climbed up on this big wooden object with the string hanging from it to desperately try to look for a crane. It was frankly embarrassing. No, I pulled a different trick. I had it so that whatever the fighter rolled was how difficult the challenge was. The fighter rolled low, so I made the thieves incompetent. The, they left like deep mud tracks. They didn't try to cover anything. They were pretty easy to find. Um, so it's like, you know, you, you, you rolled low, but you know, it's fine. These guys are dumb. You did it. Uh, if the fighter had rolled high, if they'd rolled like, like, 
if they'd rolled a 20 or higher, I would have said, ooh, these guys were good. They tried to cover their tracks by mopping it up with uh, branches and brooms, but you were too clever for them and you found them. Um, I actually had the characters roll low a lot. Um, the survival check I had them make where they noticed like the typical animal tracks you'd find in the woods, that meant they found like tracks of like wolves, bears, deer, but they did not spot the dinosaur tracks. So that would have been a heads up for them had they made that survival check. Um, the cleric did a knowledge check, but did not roll very high. It's like, that's definitely a zombie, but I can't really tell you much more about it. Um, although I admit I had that be a low roll because I wanted to have a little bit more suspense, a little more fun to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, the, the whole point was to make you crave more. So if, if you felt, um, agitated that I did not like play the scenario out completely, that was kind of the idea. I wanted you to like want to jump in and play um, the decisions you might make. Like honestly, the decision to stay and fight or try to run, try to bust open the cage and run away. It's a coin toss as to whether that was the right call. Dungeon master style. I do have a lot of things that I do. Uh, my favorite one is you might've heard of a concept called the murder hobo. A murder hobo is what you get when um, players just kind of, you know, just go around and kill everything willy nilly. The thing is, I think it's the result of conditioning. A lot of people have sort of a, a very binary way of approaching the game. Either you succeed at a role or you fail at a role um, without really accepting like some of the nuance that might happen there. Um, like if you look at things like history or knowledge checks or something like that, there's often like tiers of success in there. Um, but what I like to do is I use something I call the two strike system which takes inspiration from death saving throws. You don't die upon failing one death saving throw. You have to fail three um, or two if a guy is, you know, hurting you, standing next to you. Um, <clears throat> but what I do is if it's something that is a bit delicate, like if you're trying to sneak past guards is my favorite example. Your first failure of the group does not, you know, cause something to happen. You know, a, a, most DMs will, you know, you know, old Grog Fack in his big heavy armor rolls a seven on a stealth check. The guards see you roll initiative. Um, I would make it to be like the guards hear Grog Thack, but they don't see him. They're alerted that somebody is there, but they don't know. Like they pick up their spears and they like nervously start to approach the area where the, the players are hiding. They're not like starting. I'm not asking for initiative or, or something like that. Um, basically the situation worsens but it does not become inescapable. At this point, you know, I want to like have the party thinking, hmm, there's gotta be a way out of this. Do they um, continue to sneak, try to sneak despite the clear disadvantage they'll be at now? Do they prepare and launch an ambush to try to take out the guards before they can call for help? Do, um, does the druid turn into a cat and step out to make the guards think, oh, that was the noise they heard. Um, does the warlock step aside and be like, excuse me, gentlemen, I seem to be lost and, you know, try to try to schmooze their way through the situation? Or do they just pull the plug and run away? If you can drill into your heads, uh, into their heads, that your players can always try something else to get out of a situation, you can shake a murder hobo tendency real fast. So yeah, that's basically all I have to say. A lot of people liked the adventure, even though it is extremely simple. It's basically negotiating with a noble for a good amount of pay to get their dog back. Um, and then you go out and you find that the kidnappers have been eaten by dinosaurs, but now you have to fight the dinosaurs to save the dog. Um, that could be like maybe a two hour session. Maybe I should, like I said, maybe I should write that up or something at some point, but, and so yeah, that's, that's the basic gist for what I've got going on. Um, you can indeed host a pretty nice and fancy Dungeons and Dragons event, including mapped encounters without having to spend a lot of money, especially if you have a bunch of stuff up front. Um, although I wonder if my next challenge should be trying to figure out how to play a game for free. That would be, that would be an interesting one. I'd have to do some different caveats for that. Like all the stuff I paid for in the dollar store video, like the pens and the paper and stuff like that, like the pens, the tools, things that, you know, I'd be expected to have. I might have to write that off. And of course, I can't commit any crimes to do that. Although, speaking of free, June 24th of this year, 2023, is Free RPG Day, where local game stores have a bunch of stuff for RPGs that you can just kind of go and pick up. Like, I've got like this, uh, this, uh, 
Ice Spire Peak little preview adventure where you have to save some gnomes from a mimic at like level one or like level two, which is, you know, mimics are pretty scary at level two, but they have all sorts of really neat stuff. But of course, like with free comic book day, they set up free RPG day with the expectation that you're buying something. Although hilariously that June 24th, coincidentally lies right in line with the release of the Warhammer 40,000 Leviathan box. So if you show up and say like, hey, I'm going to spend $250 in your store. Can I have some free RPG stuff? You know, they'll gladly let you take whatever you want, probably. Um, but yeah, it's a good reminder that that's coming up on the 24th. Hopefully I will have some more fun video stuff going on. And until next time, this is Kodak signing off. So yeah, thanks again for watching, especially thanks to our $10 and up patrons, including Monster Crown, Spirit Tem, Blood Beagle, Isaac the Terrible, Weird Warp, Christopher P, Universe of Legends, Cody and Kaya, Danny, Vaughn, and Johnny D2. Also scrolling by are our $5 patrons, and for just $1 a month, you can get access to my Discord, where a lot of people are showing off their games, discussing designs, and occasionally we're having some game nights. I just dropped the rules for my secret game on there, so if you want to take a look at them, then you are welcome to do so. Anyway, I do lots of videos on this channel about game design and going over games and reviews and stuff like that. If you like that, please be sure to check out the playlists I got here, and of course, be sure to like, subscribe, share the video. This is a follow-up to a pretty popular one, so if other people saw the old one, they'd probably like to see this one too. So thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Kodak signing off.